Good morning. Glad you're here. Um, I want to start out because there are two Wheaton colleges. I would just like to start out by saying we're the Wheaton College in Massachusetts, and we're a small liberal. <laughs> A little controversy around some of the other ones. Um, a small liberal arts college. Uh, we were founded in 1834 as a higher education um, opportunity for women. We were co ed about 25 years ago, and we is committed to individual academic and religious freedom. Um, so I, my role on this panel is to, uh, is to set the context. Uh, there are ways, mapping in the humanities is different from the mapping that I had done before not in the humanities. And so I would like to set the context why it's different, and then I'd also like to make a few suggestions for um, how to handle data. Uh, I um, was uh, I, I, a professor at Wheaton, John Grady and I, sort of made our, a, a name for ourselves in the early aughts of the, of the century by, by finding a way to do mapping in a very, very small way. So all of my mapping is characterized by being extremely simple, um, and that's good. Now, I want to tell you my um, personal victory uh, that the three maps that were, that we're going to be talking about today, the three, um, the three maps that were done this semester were done without my help, and I'm so excited about that. Um, <laughs> I, I came in at the very end and, um, and was just uh, so overwhelmed with joy that uh, it has been, nothing has institutionalized it. It doesn't need the GIS person to be there. So this is one of the first maps that uh, I, I did for a faculty member in the humanities, actually the first map. Um, a history professor um, emeritus, Travis Crosby, had uh, a, a, was teaching a course on um, Jack the Ripper in Victorian London, and he found this map. It's a by Charles Booth. Um, the lines represent uh, poverty or wealth, and uh, there was census data from 1890, contemporary census data. And so we put the census data on this map and uh, geocoded the streets, and um, the uh, and the students found wonderful things. They found that the haberdashery trades, hat making, shoe making. For years, they clustered together, but bakers were spread all, you know, sort of dis distributed across the, across the city. So that was really interesting, and so the, the students loved it. It was it was great. They were engaged fully. Uh, they were doing the blended learning thing about gathering the context and the content outside of class, and then coming in for a group experience, hands on with coaching. Uh, back then, the software was so buggy that you really couldn't expect them to do anything on their own. Um, I'll just keep on talking. Um, but it wasn't. But it was really social science methods being uh, applied to humanist content. So the next time he taught it, he just said to the students, "You're taking a virtual field trip to Victorian London. Go find stories." And that was brilliant. The students came alive, and they found wonderful stories about what a particular street was like, or a boarding house that was right next to an extremely wealthy family. Why would these strange things happen? So um, the, um, what, what I want to say next is that the, why, are, why are these things different? Why is humanities mapping different from the mapping that people think of when they think of typical GIS? And um, I got so much out of this book. Okay, I clawed my way through this book because I am not a post-structuralist. Um, but it was totally worth it because it completely changed my outlook. What is it? Charles Travis, oh, as repressed, okay. and um, it completely changed my perspective on how mapping could be done. Um, let me get, set, set some more context. Um, I got another request from a history professor who wanted to map um, travel memorabilia that was collected by Mrs. Wheaton in a, on a tour of, of London. And so she, um, ha I, I, she had a box, an archival box, full of travel brochures and laundry tickets and ticket stubs and things like this. And it was a respectable collection of stuff, but it was all different, and I didn't know what to do with it. So most of it had addresses, and so we put it in London, and there it was. It was a bunch of points. And I felt as though I failed her because I couldn't think of anything to do with it. She made a poster, she took it away, she had a good time, everything was fine. but. I was very dissatisfied until I read this book. And then I realized that it's, that's kind of the point in humanities, is your, it's, it's your, okay. 
Um, and uh, here we go. Um, you know what? If you go back up one more, let me go back to this. So what? Um, there are different there are different ways of doing analysis. Once you've got the map, and one is quantitative analysis, and that was what I was stuck on. And then there's I start to try to use the power of the GIS to say this is important to have the have the mathematical response. Yeah, this is important. But then there's eyeball analysis, and I was doing a lot of that too. It's like hey, it's like a cluster over there. That's pretty cool. But you need a lot of data to do that. Um, so what um, what what I'm what Charles Travis opened my eyes to is just that telling stories is a goal. It's not, it's not, it's not something trivial. It's it's the goal. And then the ability to put on spatial goggles and say, okay, I'm not going to be looking at the chronological um, thread. I'm going to be looking at a spatial slice right down through there. Now here is one of Charles Travis's maps. Um, he took actually this is. Uh, Charles Travis's map, contemporary map of Dublin, and I didn't know this, but apparently James Joyce was a wannabe geographer, and so when he wrote Ulysses, um, it's geographically perfect. When his character takes <coughs> 10 minutes to walk from here to there, it will take you 10 minutes to walk from here to there. And so um, it's, it's like a map in a novel. And what Travis, uh, what um, uh, Joyce did, no, 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 Joyce made the story Travis mapped the character, and then he uh, started he, he, he started putting points all over. And the points would come from anywhere in the novel. It's not just the trip. It would be the trip, not just Bloom's trip. It would also be the, the other character. Who's the other character? Daedalus. Daedalus's trip, um, where he went. So he'd be, the deep mapping is like looking at, say, a bridge. The bridge. And so every time uh, Bloom went to the bridge, every time Daedalus went to the bridge, what could you see from the bridge when someone referred in conversation back to the bridge? Um, those were all clustered on the bridge so that, Tra uh, so that Travis, as a researcher, could go back and say and take that deep slice, well, what about that bridge? And find meaning from all that collected data. So that's deep mapping, that's number one. Okay, now the other thing that Travis did was that he actually went to the effort of putting Ulysses' story onto Dublin. So here are the episodes from Homer's poem, and so they're color-coded. So here's Calypso, and here's Wandering Rocks. And so uh, with that, he was able to do actual, honest-to-God, literary discovery by um, using that. And then then the next one is um, the uh, different sources. Okay. So here again, he, he aligned different sources, but he went beyond that. He um, uh, looked at contemporary news clippings, what happened at that bridge or what happened anywhere where uh, Bloom was wandering. Uh, he, he could take different novels, you know, more literary works, and pile them on top of each other. But it's the layers. Um, there's another map that I, I, it was too complicated to try to explain, but um, someone has uh, layers of control. Um, it's a different novel, I'm sorry. Layers of control. Is the character being controlled by his own will, by the will of the people as in a democratic law, uh, the will of a tyrant, or the will of God? And so they actually made XY layers for that one, and he mapped the character's travels through Dublin that way. Okay, so next one. So here's my summary, very brief summary, of, of what um, Charles Travis is telling us. Resist positivism and reductionism. And that was what I was unwittingly doing to that first map of, um, of Victorian London. It would just seem like the only, it was the only thing I knew. So when you're talking to technology people, you're, um, as if you're a post-structuralist trying to discuss things with a technology GIS support person, you're probably going to have to deal with that cultural gap. Um, Travis is big on open knowledge. Go for open knowledge. It's not, it's not a, it's not a finite system of data from which you are extracting facts or conclusions. It's a dialogue, and it's a way for you to see. It's your spatial goggles. And then that's the, that brings it to the last one, which is your map is a tool for discovery, and so you want to be able to add things yourself. And that um, he, he's 
he's a really smart man. And so he has a tremendous grasp of the GIS software. And uh, he was doing all kinds of crazy things, which I really didn't understand. Um, but um, but he, is, he was key. He was, he was keen on making sure that he, didn't, he was not delivered a final product. He was, he was the maker. He was writing his map. Okay, so next, I'm going to move on to some um, uh, vocabulary, really. Um, when people are viewing a GIS map, there are ways of viewing it. You can just do storytelling, and that's what I've been emphasizing here. This is important. That's great. Um, and, but there's also the analyzing, and that tends to be more the traditional GIS, like what Uncle Davis says. Um, the, uh, there's also it's a place in the middle, my, what I call eyeball analysis. Hey, that's interesting. And I, when I'm dealing with social science students and they see, oh, that looks like a, something that's happening together, um, I say it's not conclusive, but it's an opportunity to, 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 to explore something. Maybe something interesting is happening there. So it's raising a question. Go, go check that out. Okay. Now, um, the, uh, the next thing is about authoring. So there's the what you see is what you get thing, which is like Google Earth, and that's beautiful, and I'm totally in love with Google Earth. And then there's another way of doing it, which is putting your data outside in a data structure. So I want to talk just a little bit about that in a very schematic way. So if you can imagine this is the Amazon River, and Domingo's going to be talking about this map of the Amazon River, and the points, those are data points that he has about this on his river. And so let's say that point represents the first mission that Samuel comes, Samuel Fritz comes across. And so uh, in Google Earth, you place the point, you type in the title, you put it in your text, you make a link to a picture, and, and there you go. Okay, it looks beautiful. Now behind that in Google Earth, there's sort of this little list that says you've got an ID number and you've got your mission one, and then it's going to you know, link to all the other things it's going to do. Okay, so that's one way of authoring, is you just put in a point, you type it, and you go for it. Now, uh, Domingo knew that he was going to have a lot of points and that his points were going to be gathering more details as through the years. And so this could, you know, he could do this, but it was going to be very cumbersome to edit and maintain it. So we, we added another step, we had a little bit of complexity to use the data structure method. So we still have our Amazon, we still have the, the, the picture that the, the viewer is going to see, we still have the title back there, but then we've got it, we're going to link it. And so this is um, made in Excel, and it's got you know, the source name and any notes you want to put, the quote, the image link, whatever it is. This, this can be an enormous spreadsheet, and you can have multiple spreadsheets. You don't have to just have one. You could have one for the images and one for um, some other, you know, a different century of uh, exploration of the Amazon, whatever. But the key is you need to have things that match. And then the, uh, in our GIS, it's called join. And you put them together, and then it will show up and do a show you. Okay, so there, this is my summary of communicating with um, technology, your technology support person as a humanist. Um, it helps to call it, it helped me to start thinking about it as evidence and not as data, because when I think data, I don't know, my brain just self just sort of snap into number mode, um, but calling it evidence opens the suggestion of using laundry tickets. Um, okay, and if you want to add, you want to aim, um, if you want to have, have it open so you can add uh, data for yourself, there's a little typo, and you want to maintain your content in Excel if you've got a lot, and you want to plan for different kinds of evidence. So now what you really want to do is you want to see the maps. So I will turn it over to uh, Jane. Oh, oh, great. Oh, yeah.